Welcome to the Working Genius Podcast, where we discuss anything and everything related to the six types of working genius and how it impacts your work and your life. I'm Pat Lynchoni, your host today, joined by Bo Johnson. How you doing, Bo? Oh, I'm really excited for this topic, Pat. Yeah, me too. Me too. And Matt Lynchoni, you're on mic today. How you doing, Matt? Doing all right. Thanks. Very good. We have Karen in studio helping me out. Matt, what is today's topic? Today, we're going to be talking about guilt around our frustrations. That's right. Everybody has working frustrations, but each frustration carries with it a, an area of guilt, which is a lie, which is something we can't let ourselves mm. believe. And so we just want to talk about this today so that we can better help people shed guilt that is unnecessary. Yeah, and it was interesting. We were we were talking a little bit about what topic we should discuss about working genius, and then we kind of pulled back and we said, "There's probably something like right in front of us that we see all the time, but it's just it's like a fish in water." But we keep hearing stories of people. And Pat, I'd love for you to share what was it that made this topic, you know, this many episodes in, be something that you wanted to be able to discuss? Because it actually the working genius story kind of began with the idea of guilt. Right. And now here we are returning to it. What was it that made you want to talk about that today? Well, there's just so many people I know that have been suffering for years, telling themselves this narrative about themselves that, that is just not true. And it's because they didn't have any language for understanding what their gifts were and frankly, what their lack of gifts are. And once they realize that it's, it's so liberating to be able to say, I'm not bad. It's, it's not a defect. It's actually a good thing to understand this. And I need to shed the guilt I feel. It's really, it's one of the most powerful parts of this is to accept your limitations and realize it's not your fault. Yeah. And I think we're going to actually go through each genius and talk about the specific guilt that they feel. I know that what happened for me and and is still tempting to happen is because I feel that guilt, I try to overcome that with more work. And I try to overcome that by becoming somebody that I'm not, and I'll share this when we get to some of my frustrations, but that actually leads to more frustration and, and more guilt. It's this kind of this death cycle of, we feel guilty about something that we try to overcome it. And it leads to feeling more guilt about it because we're not, we're not built to be able to have all six geniuses. Right. And you know, and it, it, it leads to guilt and, and which, which makes you want to work harder at the very wrong thing. I mean, imagine going through life and sitting down and meeting somebody and saying, hey, you're not very good at this. You should spend most of your time working on that. It's like that's a recipe for for, for frustration and and misery. The other thing it does is when we don't accept it about ourselves and we feel guilty, we deny it and we tell people, no, that's not true. I'm actually pretty good at that. And I think one of the most interesting things about working genius is when somebody is in denial of what their frustrations are, it is really – frustrating to the people around them as well. Whereas mm-hmm. when somebody goes, oh, this is one of my two frustrations. Yeah, I do suck at that. It's, it's like everybody's like, oh, I'm so glad you acknowledged that. Mm-hmm. So it's really important that we don't deny our frustrations and guilt can make us do that. So I know we're going to talk about each of the frustrations and the guilt. And of course, the three of us who are on mic all have frustrations. Before we go specifically i just love to hear, and I think people would love to hear generally, Matt and Pat, before Working Genius, just generally, what is it that you felt guilty about at work? Did you walk around, now can you look in the review mirror and say, oh, I I walked around generally feeling guilty about this? Before we came up with Working Genius? Yeah, before we came up with Working Genius. Wow, that's a great question. Yeah, I felt like I was flaky. Flaky. Unreliable and flaky. How about you, Matt? I can go with some some stronger words than that for sure. <laughs> the way I view shortcomings in terms of work, but and I've talked about this on the podcast before. But my frustrations, obviously, obvious to you guys, I'm sure, is invention and tenacity. And I went around thinking I was lazy, that I didn't care, that I didn't really have any insights to offer, like creative insights, like anything to provide the rest of the team. But the the main one was just that I thought I was lazy. And I think the combination of those two things just makes you feel useless. Like I didn't really know what I brought to work. Mm-hmm. And uh, the working definitely useless. 
That is tragic. I mean, and that's a, so many people in life. And then there, be, there becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And they start to say, yeah, I guess I just don't care about this. And it's like mm. those lies, those, those, that, that unnecessary guilt can be tragic. And I don't mean to, around just you, Matt. I mean, so many people I've talked to have spent their lives walking around feeling less than they should because they didn't realize they just didn't have certain gifts. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's funny how I think a couple different times that I've been on the podcast, we've ended up talking about the difference between before working genius and what we felt guilty about. And so I don't want my contribution to the podcast to be always this. Wah, wah, wah. I used to <laughs> no, that. don't worry about it. Well, let's take this on. Which one should we start with you guys? Which one should we start with? That we should we talk about the guilt that's associated with each genius? I think we usually start with W. So Okay, let's do it. People that don't have W, and W is a very misunderstood genius. It is. But when people look at this and they realize they don't have W, oftentimes they feel like they're not deep. Mm -hmm. They're like, I lack depth. How come mm -hmm. other people can sit and look at a sunrise and ponder things and ask questions and, 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 and go into an issue without an answer and just say, why are things the way they are? I know mm -hmm. that I don't have W as a genius. It's a, it's a competency. And sometimes I think, man, am I, am I kind of shallow or am I not interested in those things? So the, the, the guilt category would be that you're not deep. Now, Matt, you have wonder. Mm -hmm. Me and Bo don't. Mm -hmm. So help us understand what you think we, we should be thinking about ourselves as people that don't have wonder as a genius. Well, I think one way to think about it that's kind of funny is that I had a friend once tell me that they were jealous because I, that I was mysterious and they felt that they were uninteresting. Wow. Interesting. That it seemed like there was more going on and that like I was thinking about things and even though most of W is relatively unobservable, that they could tell there was more behind what I was saying. And when they like reflected on themselves, they didn't feel like they had any interesting background to the stuff depth. that they, yeah, depth is a better way to put it yeah. for sure. Fascinating. I remember a really close friend of mine is a WD and I was in Washington DC and he lives close to there. So I was like, Hey, come and meet me. My first meeting is until 11. We'll go and look at a museum or something and get breakfast. And so we went to the national art gallery, which would have been the least likely one that I would have been to attend. <laughs> and I like art in theory, right? And here <laughs> I am walking around with this, deep human and he's standing in front of this painting for many more minutes than I could ever stand in front of a painting. And <laughs> I remember feeling that feeling of like, I guess I just don't have it. Maybe my, may, maybe there's like something deep inside of me that's just missing that and act and, and it actually felt sort of spiritual. Like, oh, am I less than that? He can look at this statue or this painting and and i understand working genius i was going to do a working genius session and still can <laughs> feel that like guilt about not having the the same deep inner kind of resources that he had you know it's interesting i think about like the 10 commands that don't don't envy other people don't don't covet their goods and their things and i think when you meet somebody who's got an extra level of this there's two ways to look at that. It's like, isn't that awesome that there's stuff going on in your head that's because because God gave you the genius of wonder. Or we can go, hey, how come I didn't get all of them? Hmm. Right? And the truth of the matter is none of us get all of them. Yeah. And it doesn't mean you're not deep, but it might be somebody else is got levels of depth and introspection that just makes them unique. And that's why we need each other. I also think that there's, or I wonder, see, I'm trying, Look if there you. are <laughs> certain environments that are more likely to kind of perpetuate that guilt. And we, I'm sure we'll talk about this when we get to enablement, but I was in a nonprofit setting for many, many years. I worked at a, in a church and enablement is one of my frustrations and surrounded by these wonderful, caring people. In fact, at one point I led, if you can believe this, I, I led our care team, which is sort of a, a joke for anybody who knows me, but <laughs> I, I felt extra guilt in an environment where everybody else seemed to have it, right? Like yeah. the guilt around, I'm doing this live, but like the guilt around 
a frustration of wonder comes to life in an art gallery. And there's probably environments where everybody feels especially guilty based on their geniuses. Yeah, I think if you were a contemplative monk, you might feel a little out of your element without wonder. You know? Yeah. If you were a poet yeah. or a philosopher, you know, <laughs> it's like, nope, just want to get my work done and get home and watch the football game. I'm a philosopher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that might be a yeah. little bit interesting. Or maybe what more day to day, that? even for people like, I wonder if, if church settings are that way for some people. Of, I feel like, boy, people around me seem to really be getting something out of some of these moments and they're not. What do you think about that? Yeah, you know, Laura loves poetry. My wife is a W. And she loves, and I'm always like, don't get it. Sorry, <laughs> it doesn't work for me. Uh -huh. And I always think, gosh, what's wrong with me? I mean, I'll admit like Shakespeare. I'm always like, whoa, what's wrong with me? I think I'm a writer. I should be like, mm. oh, Shakespeare, it's wonderful. And I'm like, I don't understand it. And she sees things there that I don't see. And that's great. That's mm. great. Yeah. Let's talk about invention, Pat. What What is the guilt associated with somebody if they have no invention or if that's well, a frustration for them. Karen is sitting here next to me and Matthew, you're on mic and both of you have invention as a working frustration. So what is it that comes to mind? Like the, the unnecessary and unfair, unfair guilt that you feel because it's not a genius of yours. Well, I used to be really embarrassed when somebody would ask me something, like if you would put me in front of a whiteboard and obviously I'm around you and other people in the office that are, intelligent and creative people. And you would sometimes be flip it to me and say, Hey, do you have any ideas? And I, it was embarrassing before I understood what my geniuses mm. were because I just wouldn't have any ideas. It just makes you feel like you're uncreative. And I realized we're asking you these questions. You're like, do I have to come up with this on the fly? <laughs> yeah. I mean, even now it's hard and it is a lot more comfortable knowing that I can be okay right. with that and that you guys right. understand. That. Yeah. Uh, Karen wrote down the word boring. Like she said, sometimes yeah. it's like, I don't have, you know, things are vanilla. I can't come up with something from scratch. I can't come up with this awesome idea. I'm not creative or imaginative. And, and you, can, you can have this self-attack that says that's, there's something wrong with you. And the fact of the matter is, just because you don't have that doesn't mean you're not creative in other ways. You know, unoriginal is another thing that, that people can think about themselves. And they can, can get stuck and without coming up with new ideas. It's so funny was when you talk to somebody who doesn't have this as a genius, Bo and I don't walk around going, we are so creative, you know, but mm -mm. people that don't have I are like, wow, what's wrong with me? And it's like, you know, nope, they're not limited. It's just a different way to see things. Yep. Nicole and I were at dinner with some friends. We were out on a double date and Time was short. We hadn't seen them in a while. And I said, hey, let's all throw out potential topics for discussion tonight at dinner. Well, both of the other husband and wives are inventor galvanizers, just like me. And Nicole has invention as a frustration. And so we're throwing out ideas and she's sitting back and on the car on the drive home, she's like, boy, I didn't love that. I felt pretty dumb that I couldn't oh. come up with an interesting topic for all of us to get to engage in. At dinner. And again, that's a, a little bit that environment thing. A little bit that's my fault for not thinking about that in advance. But, but a lot of it is also just not true. Just because you can't invent on the fly there doesn't mean you're not smart or creative or interesting or able to put things together. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Cody is not here today. He's with, he's on, with a client, which is great. It's very interesting stuff he's doing. But Cody is not an I. And he and I have the same Myers-Briggs type. So for the longest time, we thought... Oh yeah, we're, we're really similar in which we are, but he would always feel like, man, do I watch too much TV or did I not exercise that part of, why don't I come up with ideas fast and out of nowhere like you do? And then when we did this, he realized, oh, it's just not my gift. And so he doesn't mm -hmm. feel guilty about that anymore, but he used to, he used to think, what is wrong with me? And that's probably the, what is wrong with me? And the answer is nothing. Mm -hmm. This is who you are and, and no more guilt around those things. Okay, let's and move it, on to, oh, go ahead, Bo. Well, I was just going to say, and it's also permission to let other people use their geniuses and work in their geniuses because we are limited. We do not have all six geniuses. So 
great news. There are people around you who would love to use theirs. We were chatting about exactly. this today too, Pat, of like, it's the simplest idea, but asking for help and being, well, being able to receive help is an act of humility. Yeah. And we get to go to Matt now. Matt, you're deep. We're not shallow, but you are deep in terms of wonder. What are you thinking? Tell us all the different nuances of this. We're celebrating what Matt is great at, not bemoaning the fact that we don't have that. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Now we get to discernment. This is, this is one that's loaded with guilt for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So Matt, what is it that people who don't have discernment or they have it as their working frustration can wrongfully feel guilty about and accuse themselves of? That they think they're dumb or not intelligent. Yeah. Not, they think, oh, I'm not smart. How do, how do the, these other people see things quickly and, and, and grasp something by just looking at the, the basic outline of things? And, and some people don't have super high levels of intuition compared to people that have discernment. And so they go, there's something wrong with me. I'm not that smart. Now, what's interesting is super intelligent people can have discernment as a frustration because intelligence mm -hmm. is raw horsepower, whereas discernment is a gift. And there's people that have never gone to school that have good discernment. And there's other people that have studied their whole lives and are experts and have great horsepower, but don't necessarily have discernment. And that's not a bad thing. It's just a different genius. I think it might be the hardest one for folks to be able to say out loud, to be able to acknowledge, again, probably based on your environment, but to say, oh, frustration, one of my frustrations is discernment. And when I'm with people who are able and willing to say that, I just have such respect for them. The, the, the courage to be able to say, you know what? I trust somebody else's discernment in this, in this setting. I don't get it. I don't see it. I trust your ability to do that. You know, one of the most powerful characteristics, the most attractive characteristics in a human being is humility. Mm -hmm. People are drawn to truly humble people. And I love when somebody, regardless of what their working frustration is, when they go, hey, that is a struggle for me. I'm always like, you rock regardless mm -hmm. of what it is. And I've worked with CEOs of big companies that said, I don't have discernment. I need people around me because I'll make decisions based on data. And I need to turn to somebody and go, what is your gut telling you? Because I don't have a gut for this stuff. And I think, mm. good on you. Good on you. So I think this is a hard one. I, I know for a while when we first came up with Working Genius, because the word discernment sounds like something everybody's supposed to have, my wife, Laura, would be like, ah, I have to have that. And, and we, I have a friend who was a priest and he said, I was a priest. I have to have discernment because they talk about discerning mm -hmm. vocations mm -hmm. and discerning other things. But this is different. This is just a, a genius for using your gut and intuition. Yeah, it's, and it's not surprising that this is the one that is hardest for people to come to terms with and talk about when it's their frustration. Why is that, you think? Well, I mean, when we first came up with the model, you were saying that we realized pretty early on, even through like beta testing the assessment, that discernment was the most universally desirable quality, even more than enablement, even more than tenacity, people really tested high in discernment because that's something that people really want to see themselves as. And so I think combined with the we discernment versus expertise episode that we did and really getting to like the core of the definition of what discernment is actually allows people to be like, oh, that's a frustration of mine. And that doesn't hurt to say because it doesn't insinuate that I'm not intelligent or that Something right. About character or anything. Yeah, we really had to tweak those questions to to make sure that people really understood what that was and weren't gaming it to to give themselves high scores in that area. Hmm. So, and I think I think we did a good job on that because then people were like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, that's not me. I don't. That's, I, that's not my thing." Mm -hmm. All right. So, what about galvanizing? What is the guilt that comes with with the frustration of galvanizing? People feel like I'm not a leader. I'm not inspiring, and I... I think a stronger word would just be weak. Weak? Yeah, like mm -hmm. we're talking about really deep kind of descri descriptions for how it resonates with people when they don't have that, feeling guilty. Yeah. I think like, weak is probably the, the core of it. Yeah, huh. I can't move people. I can't provoke action. Mm -hmm. I'm ineffectual. Mm -hmm. And it's so not true. Because people can do that. It's just not a natural gift of theirs. This is not one of my geniuses. It's when, and, and, and when I realized this, I felt kind of bad, like, but I'm the leader of the company. I'm supposed to be the chief galvanizing officer. But 
Mm. The truth of the matter is that's not one of the things that gives me joy and energy. And there's other people in the organization who are better than I am at it. And it's good that I let them do that. I think there's an interesting nuance here, Pat, which is it can be true that galvanizing is a frustration. So when you say, oh, it's just not true. What's not true is that you are necessarily weak. Just because you have a frustration of galvanizing does not mean that you are a bad leader. It does not mean that people would be unwilling to follow you. That's the guilt that's not true. That's helpful to be able to say out loud and helpful to be able to set down your own expectation of getting joy and energy from galvanizing, but also be able to say, just because I lack the genius of galvanizing does not mean that I am not a leader worth following. Yeah. It sounded like I was saying, it's not true that you don't galvanize. No, that's not something you like to do, but there's other ways you can use other people. You can do it in a way that's different. It's never going to be something that gives you joy and energy. Come to terms with that, but don't feel bad as though there's something wrong with you. I just had an interesting thought in in my, my words that I've been giving for each one. For W, it was useless. And for discernment, it was stupid. And for galvanizing, it's weak. I think I like using strong words for that because if I use those words and then I think, am I stupid and weak? Then I can really be like, oh no, I know that's not true. Hmm. Right. So you're saying go, go hard on, on what the word is. Actually W would be shallow. Yeah. Yeah. Shallow. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. I would be boring and having no imagination. Mm -hmm. and discernment would be, yeah, stupid Mm -hmm. and galvanizing. I think you're right. You guys, it's, it's, I feel guilty because I'm weak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. The the exaggerated self-attack or guilt actually makes it seem as preposterous as it really is. Mm -hmm. I like that, Matt. The next one is enablement. Now, Bo, you and I both have this as our working frustrations. Yep. And we have felt very guilty. Karen's sitting here next to me. This is one of her geniuses. Matt, you have it as a, as a, a competency. But yep. the fact that you and I have this, what does that make us feel, Bo? What's the, what's the guilt we feel? Well, the word I would use is unkind. Is yeah. I, 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 or nice would be like the safe way to say it. Unkind, I'm curious what word Matt has that's even like the deeper level there. Well, mine is uncaring. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, I was thinking uncaring or selfish. Yeah, mm. yeah. And I think, well, gee, you mean to say that I don't like to help people? I don't like to help mm. enable other people's dreams? Now, the reason why this is a lie is because it doesn't. we are not uncaring. It just it's difficult for us to respond to the needs of others in the way they ask. And people like Karen sitting here, with the genius of enablement, she can come alongside anybody and whatever they need, she can provide it in the way they need it on their terms. Mm-hmm. And that is much more challenging for you and I, Bo. Yep. Yeah, the uncaring is that actually felt like a, a little bit of a sucker punch because it feels exactly what I have felt for a long time of, you know, and again, back to that environment thing, I spent many years in higher education alongside college students and many years in a nonprofit setting where there are environments where caring is really, really important. It's not just that it's, it's value, but it's actually really, really needed. And I remember thinking at one point, I'm going to be seen as the most caring person here and, and overworked myself to try to do something that is actually a frustration for me and neglected the parts of me that are could actually have brought more value to those environments. Right. You know, it's interesting, Bo, people that have, like for you and I, we love to help people, but we are really best at helping them using our geniuses. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that we're not caring, but it's difficult for us to just be caring right out of the gate. And on their terms. Yeah. On other people's terms. And even Mm -hmm. as we're saying this, I feel kind of guilty for this. But mm. that's the nature of this. So selfish. It's, oh, we're, we are not horrible, selfish, self-centered people. We are, you know, so the next time somebody asks you for help, just say, hey, listen, I don't have enablement. It's not my fault. Because <laughs> mm. we have children. We have friends. We help them a lot. It just doesn't come easy for us the way it does to others. Yeah. 
I think that it's really helpful uh, as we're going through these both for self-talk, for the things that we say to ourselves, the voice that we listen to in our head, but also the words that we use to other people. Because I think yeah. sometimes we can be a little cavalier in, in the words that we say to other people and knowing based on their frustration, the guilt they already walk around with, that we could be pushing on a bruise that's a little bit sensitive already. Yeah, I think that's great advice. All right, and we move to tenacity. Matt, Bo, and I, we all share a working frustration in tenacity. And we, you alluded to this, both of you did, and you talked about it, Matt. And so what, what do we do? How do we feel guilty? And what do we say to ourselves that we are what? Lazy. I think this one's pretty cut and dry. Yeah. I don't lazy. care. I'm unmotivated, lazy. When you said that I don't care, not about people, I don't care about the work because I didn't finish. Mm -hmm. I didn't drive it to completion. I'm not a hardworking person. I don't have a strong work ethic. Mm -hmm. What a dangerous thing to say when it's really just a lack of genius in tenacity. Again, not an excuse, but innately, I don't wake up every morning and go, I want to cross 12 things off my list. I'm a tiger for finishing things. Mm. Yeah, I think that because I'm double disruptive, invention and galvanizing are both disruptive. I don't think there's been that many people who've actually said that I'm lazy, although I've definitely had a script in my head that I'm not working hard enough. But I do know that people have said, why can't you stick with something? It's that finishing thing. What do you, ah, does yeah, that that's resonate with you at all? Yeah, that's better than lazy too. It's like, for me, it's, you're flaky. You're unreliable. Yeah. yeah. You know? That's interesting. I think that might have to do with what our geniuses are. Because Bo's got such a high motor because he's invention, galvanizing, and he's constantly doing stuff and moving. So I don't think anybody would say that he's not working hard because he's got such a high motor. But for me, I've felt lazy because it's wonder and discernment are my geniuses. There isn't much movement going on. Observable. As yeah. To, to Bo. That's yep. interesting. Yeah. Today, I, I, I will tell you, today I got off a call. We did some good work. We, we, we got a bunch of stuff done. I sat down to play Wordle for three minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on, five minutes. It takes me at least five minutes to get it. And I felt horrible. I was like, <laughs> oh, I should be on to the next thing. I should be wow. driving something forward. And it's like, well, that's not one of my geniuses. I got to give myself a break. Hmm. The script in my head says, Pat, you're just flaky. So... It's good to know. Karen, what's it like not to have tenacity in your working frustration? It's pretty sweet. You don't feel lazy. No, she laughed. No. <laughs> Nobody That's would great. accuse you of that. You That's know, I, I'm in this conversation seeing the value of being able to say it out loud, that that being saying that you're flaky, Pat, that actually is would not be humble. But it, but it is humble, right? Because it's sort of self-deprecating in the wrong kind of humility. Yeah. But humility is the recognition of that which is true. Yes. Now, I mean, I, I suppose there are people in the world who are both flaky and lack tenacity, but you would see that in other ways. But it's not because mm -hmm. you lack tenacity. That's another quality that people have for whatever reason. But yeah, it's not humble to, to lie to yourself about something. Yeah. It's very helpful to be able to say a lot. And I think it probably goes without saying, I'll say it anyway. People appreciate vulnerability. That when we're able to be in groups with close friends, to be able to even say some of what we might feel guilty about to each other, to colleagues, to a spouse, to close friends, people appreciate that, don't they? And it, and it's so helpful, even this conversation for me, to be able to say it out loud. And we didn't fix the fact that sometimes I felt like I'm uncaring or don't have a high motor to finish things or that I can feel that way about myself, but it's helpful to be able to say out loud and acknowledge, I am limited, I have two geniuses, I have two frustrations, like everybody else, we need each other. Yeah, I love it, I love it. So, and, and the other thing is celebrate other people's extraordinary gifts rather than hmm. attack yourself for not having them. So you and I are not shallow, Karen, you either. Matt is particularly thoughtful and deep in his wonder, and that's a wonderful thing. Matt, you and Karen are not unimaginative. Bo and I just naturally have an inclination to come up with new ideas. You know, 
If you, all of us have discernment, but we have plenty of friends and family members that don't, they are not dumb. They're not dumb at all. But sometimes our gut feeling is something that would be good for them to check in with. And similarly, galvanizers, they're, they, they're great at moving people. I'm, I admire them. I'm not one of them. But it doesn't mean we're weak. We're not uncaring, but I love the fact, Karen, that you have such a strong enablement and you're ready to, to help in a moment's notice. And finally, Matt, Bo, we are not lazy, but we love when people have tenacity and they come alongside us and they push us to finish things and that's a gift. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, let's, let's abandon our, the lies we tell ourselves and the unnecessary guilt we feel and, and let's instead lean into our geniuses. All right. All right. Thanks, you guys. This was fun. This was fun. I feel better. And so before we close, though, we have an announcement, right, Matt? Yeah. The Working Genius Podcast has actually hit a million downloads as of yesterday. So I think we've we started the podcast a year and a half ago, if I'm not mistaken. Now, we were not sure how long it would go, but it is growing and more people. I keep People keep coming up to me and saying, hey, I listened to your podcast on Working Genius, and we really appreciate the, the comments people give us and that they share it with others because mm-hmm. that's how this grows. It's word of mouth. So we are really excited about that. And in the new year, so many people have been getting certified. We are going to be having even more certification classes so that people can take this and share it with the rest of the world. So a million downloads. That's great. We appreciate our listeners. And so we will talk to you all next time on the Working Genius Podcast. Thank you again for listening. God bless. Mm -hmm.